Hello everyone, uh, my name is John Pierce and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences uh, at the Medical University in South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. And first I'd like to thank uh, Jesse and Anna for inviting me to speak today and also thank you all for coming today to hear the talk. Uh, so today I'm going to focus my talk on exposure characterization methods. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit from directly estimating health effects to looking more at how mixtures behave in the environment. So what are their environmental distributions? You know, for example, what types of combinations occur? Where do they occur? And when do they occur? And how can we discover these types of combinations in our data? And that's really what my talk is gonna focus on today. Okay, so a quick overview. Uh, today I'd like to touch on some brief motivation to why we want to approach mixtures in that particular fashion. Uh, present some of our research questions, talk about our overarching approach, uh, in particular, uh, the self-organizing map algorithm um, for conducting our approach, and then illustrate our approach using uh, a complex data set uh, of ambient air quality. Okay, so what motivates us to research mixtures, right? So what do we know about mixtures? We know that they exist in the environment. We know that there are many thousands of pollutants in our environment. And so we know that exposures most likely occur as combinations to all of these pollutants. So, sorry. Um, and then we know that data on environmental mixtures is actually growing quite rapidly. So we know we have a lot of sources of exposure assessment data coming in. This could be questionnaires, biospecimens, environmental measures and modeling. So for example, we know recently there's been an introduction of low cost monitoring technology that individuals can now go out and collect their own exposure information. So this has really given us a wealth of data to start to look at environmental exposures and in particular environmental mixtures. So what do we do with all of this large volumes of data? Well, many of us, uh, I imagine in this room, are starting to kind of shift our research directions to look at environmental mixtures. In particular, uh, we may be coming from it from an exposure assessment standpoint, where we're primarily interested in looking at, you know, what types of exposures occur, how often, how long they last, and their magnitudes. Or we may be looking at it from an epidemiological perspective where we want to do statistical modeling to estimate health effects. In the talk today, I'm primarily going to focus um, on addressing mixtures from an exposure assessment perspective because I'm really interested in learning about these data sets. And so in my experience, uh, when I start to look at mixtures, I'm presented with lots of new data, lots of new variables, lots of new potential combinations that I need to learn about. And so, how do I go about doing that? Well, simply put, we address mixtures as a classification problem. So in short, really what we would like to do is to be able to describe variations in mixtures or combinations using classes or subgroups in the data set. Uh, we use an unsupervised approach because in many cases, we don't know a lot about our mixtures data set, and so we need to discover the types of patterns that occur in these complex data. This has many benefits. So, you know, as presented in the previous talk, uh, multicollinearity or high correlation among variables is really problematic for uh, mixtures research. Well, classifications help alleviate this problem by reducing the dimensionality, dimensionality of the data. Uh, generally speaking, classes are pretty straightforward and easy to interpret. And statistically speaking, uh, in subsequent analysis, you can assess effect sizes between classes so we can estimate things like joint effects. There are some challenges, of course. Uh, in particular, for unsupervised learning, there tends to not be a direct measure of success. Um, as with any dimension reduction approach, information loss is a big concern. Uh, choosing the correct number of classes or an appropriate number of classes can also be challenging. And then determining things like reference groups. So how do we base our exposure comparisons? For example, there may be situations when all pollutants are low and there's an obvious reference group. However, there may also be situations where 
pollutants are high on almost all of your classes, making reference difficult to identify. The, the approach we illustrate today uh, for conducting exposure classifications is the algorithm known as the self-organizing map. So what is a self-organizing map? It is very briefly a statistical learning algorithm uh, for addressing high dimensional data problems. Uh, it was introduced by Tuevo Cajonan in the 80s. Uh, it is effectively a hybrid between k-means clustering and multi-dimensional scaling. Uh, it's been applied in a broad range of applications, everything from text mining to economical forecasting to synoptic climatology to more recently, uh, in some of our work, assessment of environmental mixtures. Uh, we like this approach because it excels at data compression and visualization, so that's kind of a benefit of kind of the blending of the two methods of the k-means clustering and the multidimensional scaling, uh, and it helps interpret these complex data sets. In this particular setting, it helps us address a few questions. Uh, for example, what types of mixtures exist in our data set? And are these mixtures similar or different? So we think that's a second question um, that will be important in subsequent analysis. So how do we interpret the results from a SOM? So when you apply SOM, you are basically given two results back. Uh, the first being uh, what we may all know as a class profile. For those of us that have done clustering analysis or classification, uh, this class profile is used to illustrate the attributes under that given subgroup. Uh, so SOM provides this. The additional piece of information that the SOM provides is what is known as the Cajonan map. And so this is an illustration of those classes or profiles on a two-dimensional surface that allows you to gain understanding about the relationships between the classes. And it does this through a spatialization of placing class profiles that are similar close together on the map and class profiles that are different further apart on the map. And so we think this provides a nice framework for better understanding how classes may be similar or different. Okay, so moving forward, uh, we're going to illustrate our approach uh, by addressing uh, environmental mixtures in the context of ambient air quality. So we know that air quality uh, is a very complex mixture. Uh, it's a composed of many, many pollutants that also vary over time and space. The objective here is to apply SOM to learn more about the types of air pollutant combinations that we experience across the United States and we're gonna apply it to a case study data set looking at PM 2.5 and some compositions of that data. The example data we're gonna look at today uh, is EPA PM 2.5 speciation data for the year of 2015. So any of you can go out and easily uh, grab this data from EPA's Air Data Mart. Uh, in short, it contains data on over 80 species of PM 2.5, so for example, there are many elements, uh, metals within this data, there are the ions, there are also carbon fractions, and it's really kind of a collection of data that's been captured across a, a range of networks uh, coming from the NCOR, the Chemical Speciation Network, and the Improv Networks. So in applying SOM, there's a few things we like to do to the data first. So to prepare this data for analysis, we wanted to parse down the original 80 uh, variables to uh, a number of highly representative variables, meaning that we wanted to find measures that were consistently collected across all monitoring sites. So doing that, we identified that 37 of these variables uh, were collected uh, pretty, pretty much across most of our sites of interest. This included 22 elements such as lead, chromium, copper and zinc, uh, the five ions, sulfate, nitrate, chloride, and potassium, as well as 10 different measures of the carbon fractions, being elemental and organic carbon. We apply SOM to this data set. Uh, oh, this data set, once we parse it down, uh, uh, looking across all these sites, essentially what we have are just over 13,000 days with complete observations across all of these data points, so a very large complex data set. So we tackle this 
by applying SOM in an unsupervised way. And so I note that we apply SOM in this particular setting in an unsupervised way because we want to develop classifications based on an exposure period of interest. And in this particular case, our exposure period of interest is a day. And so we would like to maximize contrast across these exposure days with SOM. We do not apply any variable selection and we're not using any health outcome or other outcome variable to drive the profile development. So what do we get after applying SOM? So in short, we condense our data down uh, to 20 different speciation day types. Here the, each panel represents a profile where bars reflect uh, the standardized means of each of these individual elements in the profile. Uh, we identify roughly nine common types. Uh, if we look here in the bottom right hand side, we see that the overwhelming majority of days in this data set are reflected by our clean day types, uh, roughly 75% of days. Uh, if we look at modest days types being day types where pollutant averages were at or slightly above average levels, we see about six different variations in those profiles, capturing roughly 22% of days in our data set. And then where things you know, certainly get pretty interesting from an exposure science standpoint are the extreme days. And this is where we saw an enormous amount of variability in the types of profiles in our day. Now this is only representing 3% of day types in our data, but to capture variation in these extremes, we needed basically 11 different profiles to capture all the, the different combinations that were observed on this end of the distribution spectrum. So I thought this was very interesting. Uh, using classifications, we're also able to identify the frequency distribution of these particular types, so we think that's pretty uh, advantageous. Uh, kind of in closing here, we've condensed down over 13,000 days with 37 pollutant measures to 20 representative types. Uh, the class profiles reveal a, a broad range of mixture types, basically ranging from very clean days to very polluted days. Uh, the class assignments reveal a somewhat lopsided frequency distribution of most days being clean or low pollution to the much more rare high pollution days. Uh, the classification structure uh, is beneficial uh, for a variety of different reasons. It can be used in subsequent analyses to, say for example, characterize potential confounders or other variables we would like to maybe make relationships, uh, draw conclusions or links to for the types of mixtures that occur. We can plot temporal or spatial distributions of the profiles, identifying where they occur. And then it also supports estimation of joint health effects and subsequent models. Okay, sorry guys, and then closing, uh, just like to briefly acknowledge uh, those that have helped me get this far. Uh, my introduction to the self-organizing map algorithm uh, occurred as part of an atmospheric science climatology group uh, at Monash University. And then I would also like to thank NIEHS and the ECHO OIF uh, for providing support to continue this work. And for more info, if you'd like to see additional uh, application of the SOM in an acute health effects study, uh, I do have a poster on Wednesday that presents an application in Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you.